If you've always imagined our planet as a solid piece of rock, it's time to find out the truth. In reality, Earth is squishy. Wait, I didn't mean the entire planet. I was talking about its insides. The thing is, Earth's interior isn't solid at all. Due to high temperatures and pressure down there, it has a squishy semi-solid consistency. Otherwise, such phenomena as volcanic activity, earthquakes, and plate tectonics wouldn't be possible. Another interesting consequence of having a planet with soft insides is a process called post-glacial rebound. Let's go back to the times of the last ice age. Look, huge portions of the surface of our planet are covered with glaciers. And this makes the underlying mantle, you see, deform and sink. And look what happens now. The ice age is coming to an end and massive glaciers are melting and receding. And then a miracle happens. The mantle starts to slowly rebound back to its original position. And probably the coolest thing is that this process is still occurring in such regions as Greenland, Iceland, and Scandinavia. The land there keeps rebounding from the weight of the giant glaciers once covering these areas. And since we're talking about ice, you should know that Antarctica is home to the largest ice sheet on our planet. It contains a mind-boggling 7 million cubic miles of ice. And that, my friend, is 70% of Earth's freshwater and 90% of the planet's ice. Now, I've got some shocking news for you, so hear me out. Earth is flat. Heh, <laughs> gotcha. Just kidding. But even though our beautiful planet isn't flat, it's not round either. You see, Earth's rotation makes the planet flatten at the poles and bulge at the equator. But all these nuances are too insignificant to be seen in Earth's pictures taken from space. That's why to the human eye, our planet seems to be perfectly round. By the way, the distribution of mass on Earth isn't equal either. You know, with huge mountains in one region and mostly plains in another. These differences in mass cause small variations in the gravitational pull. Brace yourself for some disturbing news. The moon is drifting away from us. Yes, you've heard correctly. It happens at a rate of 1.5 inches a year. What's the reason? You might have heard that the moon pulls on Earth's oceans, which creates powerful tidal forces producing a bulge of water on the side of the planet facing the moon. But this bulge also influences Earth's natural satellite. It creates gravitational pull that makes the moon accelerate and move further away from Earth. You can notice this slow but sure drift. And still, in millions of years, it'll probably have a significant effect on Earth's rotation. Not only the moon, but also Earth's magnetic pole is trying to change its location. Unlike the geographical North Pole, which is a fixed location, the planet's magnetic north wanders. Around 30 years ago, it was believed to lie in Canada, about 990 miles south of True North. But soon, scientists realized it was actually moving at a rate of around 9 miles a year. Even more bizarre, since then, it's sped up and is now moving at more than 30 miles per year. Outside of the Antarctic dry valleys, the Atacama Desert in South America is the driest place on Earth. It stretches for more than 38,000 square miles, but only gets 0.4 inches of rainfall per year. And still, despite these incredibly harsh conditions, a number of unique plants and animals manage to survive in this region. And have you seen its stunning landscapes? All those geysers, salt flats, and towering volcanoes? No wonder it's a popular travel destination. Okay, tell me, what is the largest living thing on Earth? The blue whale? Not really. Coral reefs are the largest living structures on our planet. These awesome ecosystems are made of tiny animals called coral polyps. They create calcium carbonate skeletons, which accumulate and form beautiful complex structures known as coral reefs. You know, rotation is a funny thing. Not haha <laughs> funny, but kind of strange. Not only can't you feel it, everything does it. From galaxies to atoms, the universe is taking us for a spin. 
Strangely, it was more difficult to prove that the Earth is rotating than it was to prove that the Earth is revolving around the Sun. Way back in 1610, Galileo, the father of experimental science, provided the first proof that Earth and all the other planets revolve around the Sun. Galileo showed in his telescope that Venus was going through phases like the Moon. The only conclusion possible was that Venus was revolving around the Sun. Case closed. Planets revolve. But it wasn't until 241 years later, March 31, 1851 to be exact, that Leon Foucault proved that Earth was rotating. Foucault installed a giant pendulum from the 220-foot-high ceiling of the Pantheon in Paris. That's a lot of peace. An assembly of scientists and journalists watched as the floor turned beneath the giant pendulum. The Earth turns, they shouted, eh, mostly in French. Another strange thing about rotation is that although the Earth is rotating at a constant speed, the surface of the Earth is moving at all different speeds at all different latitudes. The same is true for every planet and star. At the equator, the surface of the Earth is moving the fastest, at 1,037 miles per hour. That's much faster than the speed of sound, which is a mere 761 miles per hour. Halfway from the equator to the North or South Pole, at 45 degrees latitude, the Earth is rotating at 733 miles per hour. Standing at the North or South Pole, it would take you 24 hours just to turn around one time. And that's both boring and cold. One result of these differential rotational speeds of Earth is that it creates belts and bands not only in the atmosphere, but also on the surface of the Earth. Jupiter, of course, is famous for the belts and bands in its clouds caused by the giant planet's rapid rotation of about 28,000 miles per hour. The belts and bands on Earth's surface are somewhat overlooked, but we've got them too. We have white ice at the North and South Poles, and between the two poles, there are alternating belts and bands of dry sandy desert and moist green vegetation. This essential geography can be seen most clearly when we view the Earth rotating in space. Space agencies use the differential rotation of the Earth to their advantage. They launch their rockets as close to the equator as possible. NASA uses Cape Canaveral near the southern tip of Florida. And the ESA, the European Space Agency, uses the Guiana Space Center in French Guiana, South America, almost exactly at the equator. Because the land under a rocket near the equator is rotating at a greater speed, it gives the rocket a boost into space that launch sites near the poles cannot provide. You always want to save fuel, you know? Speaking of Jupiter, as I did about three paragraphs ago, the axis of rotation of the big planet is even less inclined than that of the Sun. The Sun is tilted at an angle of around 6 degrees, while Jupiter is only tilted 3 degrees. Jupiter stands almost perfectly upright, which combined with the great speed at which Jupiter is rotating – its entire day is less than 10 hours – it turns Jupiter into a giant gyroscope. Jupiter's gyroscopic stability, combined with its massive gravity, gives stability to the whole solar system. Jupiter prevents chaos factors from disrupting the orbits of the other planets. In other words, without Jupiter rotating like a stable gyroscope, the solar system could never have stayed intact for the billions of years that it has. Exoplanet solar systems are showing signs of chaos in their orbits. They could use a gyroscope like Jupiter to hold them together. Rotation is the real hero here. As for the Sun, its differential rotation has a big effect on its sunspot activity. Sunspots are spots or patches that sometimes appear on the Sun's surface, usually at mid-latitudes in both the northern and southern hemispheres of the Sun. As sunspot activity increases on the Sun, sunspots begin to move closer to the equator. Few sunspots are ever seen near the poles. With differential rotation, the gases at the equator of the Sun are moving faster than the gases at the Sun's poles. This differential motion of the gases twists the magnetic field lines in the Sun causing them to snap. Sunspots are magnetic eruptions rising through the surface of the Sun, hurling electrified gases far into space and emitting intense ultraviolet radiation, often in the direction of the Earth. Uh-oh. Well, have no fear, Earth's differential rotation protects us. Not only does our Earth rotate differentially on its surface, but also down into its center. Studies of seismic readings of shock waves from earthquakes indicate the metallic core of the Earth is rotating slightly faster than the surface of our planet. Scientists think that the differential rotation of Earth's magnetic core within the slower rotating metallic liquid creates the magnetosphere arising from Earth's poles and extending far out into space. This magnetosphere keeps Earth safe from electrified gases from the Sun. 
Hurrah for rotation! Far out! Now, the 9.0 megaquake in 2011 off the coast of Japan rearranged the mass of Earth's crust and caused the rotation of Earth to speed up. The day got shorter. Eh, not much shorter. 1.6 millionths of a second. But we are accustomed to seeing the Earth's rotation slowing down. The Earth rotating through the tidal action of the Moon's gravitational effect on the oceans drains kinetic energy from the Earth's rotation, causing the planet to slow down. Each day is becoming longer, about two thousandths of a second longer. Well, I need to adjust my watch. Leap years, we all know, are when we add a day to the calendar every four years, on February 29th, to straighten up Earth's yearly rotation around the Sun taking 365 and one-quarter days. But leap seconds are added to the clocks every so often to synchronize our clocks with the slowing rotation of the Earth and allow the Earth to catch up with our clocks, as if the Earth is concerned about our timepieces. 27 leap seconds have been added since 1972. The last leap second was added on December 31, 2016 and made the clocks read 6.59.60 p.m. Yeah, I didn't notice either. But the sun's rotation has unexpectedly been speeding up recently. Usually, it takes 86,400 seconds for the Earth to rotate, as measured by an array of atomic clocks in different locations on Earth and coordinated by a special service in Paris. Yes, they pay people for that. July 19, 2020 was the shortest day ever recorded, a whopping 1.46 milliseconds less than the usual 86,400. Gadzooks! If this keeps up for another five years, they may have to add a negative leap second to synchronize our clocks to Earth's increasing rotation. Computers and satellites won't like to see their clocks read January 1st at 0 o'clock, and they say time can't go backward. At least the Earth hasn't started rotating backward or stopped rotating altogether. That would be catastrophic. Everything would crash forward at whatever differential speed it was rotating on Earth. Yet, that appears to be what happened to the planet closest to Earth, Venus. Venus rotates very slowly backward, in retrograde, and that is very unusual. How so, you ask? Well, there are several theories to why Venus rotates in retrograde motion, while all the other planets rotate in prograde, or forward motion. Liquids inside a rotating sphere, like a planet, have a lot of inertia. That's why when you take an egg from the fridge, for example, and try to spin it, it won't spin. The liquid inside is just sitting there. Its inertia is resisting your attempt to spin it. However, if finally, after many turns, you manage to get the raw egg to rotate, it's hard to get it to stop spinning. If you do pick it up and put it back down, the egg will start rotating again, because the inertia of the liquid inside it is still going forward. You only stop the shell from spinning. Something like this may have happened to Venus. Wait a minute, Venus? Backspin? Tennis? Hmm, I think there's a connection here, somewhere. We know that on Venus, <clears throat> the planet, one day is longer than one year. It takes longer for Venus to slowly rotate around backward one time than it takes Venus to orbit the Sun once. But Venus is slowing down dramatically and by 6.5 minutes in the last 25 years. If there still is liquid inside Venus and the movement continues, we might see Venus completely stop spinning backward and start rotating forward again. Ah, come on Venus, let's get with the crowd! This business of retrograde and prograde rotation has got quite a bit of mystery to it. It seems that everything tends to rotate in prograde motion. If you shape your right hand like a ball and stick your thumb up to indicate north, then curl your wrist towards you, that's prograde motion. Your fingers on the left side of your hand are moving towards you. Black holes, solar systems, galaxies, atoms, stars, etc. all seem to rotate prograde, depending on which angle you view them from. Experiments at the Large Hadron Collider indicate that subatomic particles spin toward the left, prograde. It's starting to look as if we may be in a left-handed universe. Then why is it so hard to find a left-handed manual can opener or measuring tape? I don't know. It's a mystery. Among all the planets of the solar system, our Earth is unique, since it's the only one that has developed life. But what if we got a competitor? What if a second Earth appeared out of nowhere? Then there would be two different scenarios. The first is the destruction of both planets, and the second has an unexpected but pretty logical ending. But let's start with the catastrophic scenario. 
the second Earth with the same conditions could only exist if it received absolutely the same amount of sunlight as our planet. The orbit that our Earth follows is perfect for getting the necessary amount of solar heat. If we were a little further away, the entire surface of our planet would resemble Antarctica. And if Earth were a little closer to the sun, we'd all live in a huge desert inhabited by very few living beings. So, for the second Earth to be identical to ours, it would need to follow the orbit of our planet. Two massive objects can exist close to each other. The union of Earth and the Moon is a great example. But if the second object was as heavy and huge as our planet, there wouldn't be enough space for both of them. The gravity of two Earths would be a huge problem. The two worlds would collide because they would be pulled toward each other. This process would last for hundreds of millions of years. And in the end, the two planets would transform into one giant world. And their remnants would be flying around the newly formed planet, resembling the rings around Saturn. Or one of the planets would push the other out of its orbit. In this case, one of the Earths would hurtle toward the Sun and burn like a match in its atmosphere. It's also important to remember that Earth is moving at a speed of 67,000 miles per hour at all times. This is more than 80 times faster than the speed of sound. And now, imagine two huge planets that are flying toward each other at such a speed. Even a microscopic organism living in the mouth of a volcano wouldn't stand a chance to survive the collision of two Earths. Even the moon would be torn to pieces by the blast wave. But let's imagine that Earth's twin is following another orbit, somewhere between Mars and Earth. Even in this situation, people's lives would change forever. By the way, the theory that Earth might have a twin appeared long ago. Scientists of the past believed that the second planet could be hiding on the opposite side of the Sun. Thanks to modern technologies and astronomy, we know this theory isn't true. Otherwise, our telescopes and other equipment would have already caught some signals from this planet. Scientists study space objects thousands of light years away from us, so they would definitely notice another world in the neighborhood. But anyway, let's imagine that the second Earth does exist, and we've discovered it recently. The entire field of astronomy and astrophysics will immediately receive hundreds of billions of dollars in funding. The study of Earth's twin will become a priority goal for people. Experts will put forward hundreds of hypotheses about what the second Earth looks like and what's happening there. The planet is almost at the same distance from the Sun as we are. This means the weather must be the same there. Soon, scientists find out that Earth's doppelganger has liquid water and continents. But they aren't like ours. Their shapes and location are different. Most likely, life exists there too. But what is its origin? There's a hypothesis that life on our planet appeared thanks to amino acids brought here by a meteorite. It's highly improbable that the same thing happened to another world. Life most likely emerged there in a completely different way. Perhaps the fish didn't get out of the water on that planet, and the first intelligent creatures appeared in the ocean. These could be amphibians with scales and fins, or octopus-like monsters with huge tentacles. Fish on the second Earth could have come out of the water and grown limbs. But what if they didn't like walking on the ground? Then, this world might be inhabited by intelligent bird people. Or, life could have originated deep in the soil. Then evolution would create humanoid moles or highly developed worms. To find out for sure, scientists send a rover there. A similar mission to Mars was a success, so there shouldn't be any problems with this one. People on Earth are waiting. What will the rover find on the other side? It will take several years for the ship to get there. Strangely, two days after the launch, it returns. But wait, this is not our space probe! All this time, the inhabitants of the second Earth have been watching our planet too. At one point, they also sent a probe. It's made of the same materials as ours. It has a camera and a recording device. But people are worried because the rover looks similar to a mechanical spider. Can it be that giant tarantulas live in that world? Scientists understand that we need to communicate. We send our guests a radio signal with some information about our civilization. They catch this message and send their own. It contains strange symbols that resemble scratches. Linguists all over the world are trying to decipher it. Meanwhile, astronomers send the guests a recording of human speech. 
A few days later, our satellites catch a message from our space neighbors with their voices. Scientists are about to play the recording. The whole world is listening with bated breath. And it's a growl. A terrible, an absolutely incomprehensible growl. It has pauses and an unusual rhythm, but it's nothing resembling human speech. The whole planet is panicking. All countries are preparing for an invasion. The most important thing now is to build shields to protect the planet. No one can decrypt the message. It's possible that our neighbors can't understand us either. People make a last attempt to establish some contact. We send a video to explain to our guests with the help of gestures and signs that we only want peace and collaboration. The answer doesn't take long to wait. Our satellite receives their video file. Scientists play back the recording, and it's shocking! We see dinosaurs in robotic suits! Life on the second Earth has been developing in the same way as on our planet. But the infamous colossal meteorite didn't fall there. Over millions of years of evolution, dinosaurs have become sentient. In the video, they're growling and pointing with their claws at the picture of our Earth. Then they start growling even more loudly, and is it laughter? The recording ends. People consider this the announcement of the invasion. Several years have passed. During this time, scientists have exchanged messages with dinosaurs several times, and it seems we're beginning to understand them. It turns out that the reptiles also want peace. They say that their planet was once inhabited by humanoids similar to humans, but a massive flood wiped them away. Dinosaurs managed to survive and evolve into intelligent beings. It will take many years before people set foot on their planet. And when this happens, humanity will feel relieved, realizing that we're not alone. But what if there was no intelligent life on the second Earth? People would also be happy. We would know that we'd always have another home. Perhaps we'd start exploring Earth's twin right away, or begin mining its resources to replenish ours. In any case, our lives wouldn't change immediately, because that land would be too far away from our planet. Dozens of generations would pass before people begin settling on the second Earth. Our homeland planet would be losing more and more resources, so everyone would want to move to a new world. In the beginning, only the richest would be able to do it. But with time, space travel would become cheaper. People would probably invest a lot of money to build a paradise on the second Earth. If this happened, we'd be visiting this world during our vacation to breathe fresh air and enjoy nature. In any case, the human population would grow. This means that sooner or later, the second Earth would become as loaded as the first one. And then, people would start searching for a new home among the stars. By the way, if any life exists on a planet similar to ours, it's likely to look like octopuses. There's even a theory that octopuses came to Earth from some other world. Any animal has several evolutionary stages of development. For example, elephants and mammoths descended from one common ancestor five to six million years ago. Looking even further, almost all mammals evolved from one ancestor they shared with reptiles. Each species has been changing over millions of years. But not octopuses. They suddenly appeared on a family tree. From the point of view of evolution, squids would have to evolve into octopuses millions of years from now. But look, they're already here. Besides, octopuses are incredibly smart. Their genetic code is much more diverse than the human one. They may be visitors from another planet that is similar to ours. But of course, this is only a hypothesis.